Well, today was due to be our Bible Sunday service, but as Aileen is unwell and we couldn't prepare properly, it's meant that I've had to find something else for us to look at. But be assured that this is a message with the Bible right at its heart as we look at the hope that God has placed for us there with the important reminder that Christ is surely coming. Now at the moment we live in days where people are panicking. In particular there are many people who are panicking about what is called the climate crisis. Now that's the fear that global warming will bring catastrophe to the planet, bringing about much suffering if we do not take responsibility for this and drastically reduce our CO2 emissions. Now that's the message that's being brought by groups like Extinction Rebellion and Insulate Britain who you may have heard of in the news. But I was even reading an article recently, the, the last few days, which said that younger people now do not want to have children, both because of their high carbon footprint but also because they did not want them to die horrible deaths. There is real panic about what the future may bring. Now one of my boys' favourite things to watch, if it's ever on, uh, on the television, is Dad's Army, a sitcom that you know is based on the Warmington on Sea Home Guard in the 1940s. In fact, they like it so much they've got a box set of the series on DVD, which, and that makes an appearance from time to time. Now, a favourite character of theirs, and you'll, you'll probably know where I'm going already, is Corporal Jones, who can always be guaranteed in times of crisis to run round and round <laughs> like headless chickens, crying, Don't panic! <coughs> now, of course, we can appreciate Dad's Army so much more because we know what the outcome of World War II was. It was an Allied victory. These men were ultimately on the winning side. Jones' message of not panicking was right, even though perhaps he couldn't live up to it. Although it would be fair to say that if we were looking at the potential of imminent invasion, we might well be panicking too. Now the message for Christians in 2 Thessalonians 1, to begin with, when we look at the end of the world, is don't panic. God is in control. Our sure and certain hope is that Christ is surely coming. That Jesus is going to return to completely fulfil God's promise of salvation to us and bring us fully into God's eternal kingdom where we can enjoy our relationship with our Heavenly Father forever. Now what a wonderful hope that is. And the living Lord Jesus personally guarantees it for us. So now we know what the end of God's plan for the world is. Surely it should be a case for us of don't panic when things don't go as we either want or expect them to. Now this is what we're going to be thinking about this morning, as God reveals through Paul what his plan, or something of what his plan for the world will look like, so that we know that Jesus will return soon. But that's 2 Thessalonians 1. There are now other issues for Paul to deal with, and we're going to look at what those are as we read together 2 Thessalonians and chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians and chapter 2. <clears throat> Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you brothers not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report or letter, supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. 
Don't you remember what, that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendour of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lies, so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. But we ought always to thank God for you brothers loved by the Lord because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us, and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Well, after the wonderful encouragement that's been chapter one, we come to an issue which was obviously worrying the Thessalonians. What was that worry? Well, we see in verses one to four that there was evidently some false teaching during the rounds of churches in the form of prophecy reports or letter, which was supposed to come from the apostles, which said that the day of the Lord had already come. Now for these relatively new Christians, this was alarming. Was putting their trust in Jesus actually a waste of time because he had already returned? Was all that struggling and suffering under persecution for nothing? Paul's answer is that their faith is absolutely not a waste of time. Anyone who was teaching these things was seeking to deceive the Thessalonians and draw them away from their faith in Jesus. And Paul encourages the Christians there to be vigilant in watching for an important sign as they prepare for the Lord Jesus to return. He tells them for that day, that is the day of Jesus' return, will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. <clears throat> so this is going, a significant event that's going to happen before Jesus returns. But what does it all mean? Well, to understand this, let's contrast the man of lawlessness with Jesus. If we turn to Philippians 2, 6 to 11, we come to that very important passage about what God has done for us in Jesus. And Paul writes here of him, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Basic points of that are that Jesus took on our humanity, although he was never less than God, in complete obedience to God his Father. He obeyed willingly 
out of love. In complete loving obedience to God, he allowed himself to be taken and put to death on a cross, bearing our sin on his shoulders, as he took our place in paying the debt that we owe to God for our rejection of him and rebellion against the laws he gave us so that we could live to please him. This is sin, of course. For us, this was an unpayable debt because every one of us sins. Jesus was the only one who could pay that debt in full because of his perfect obedience to God his Father. God demonstrated his acceptance of the complete payment of our debt for sin when he raised Jesus from the dead and raised him up to the greatest place of power in heaven. One day, on the day of Jesus' return to this earth, everyone is going to have to bow the knee to him and everyone is going to have to acknowledge his kingly rule, whether they want to or not. Now before we go any further I want to ask you if Jesus came this morning how would you have to acknowledge his kingly rule? Would it be with joy as he comes to fulfill your salvation so that your real relationship with God will really last forever? Or will your acknowledgement be in fear of his judgment on your life because you have ignored him. Jesus is willing to receive all those who come to him, trusting in him to make them right with God so that they can begin a brand new relationship with him which will last forever. Are you going to take up his offer today? I trust that you do. So Jesus has come into our world, living in perfect obedience to God, even to dying on a cross. And it's because of that obedience he is in the place of power and authority in heaven. Now contrast what Jesus has done with what Paul says will happen back in verses 3 to 4 of 2 Thessalonians 2. Jesus showed perfect obedience to his Father. But here, there will be a rebellion. This is not a rebellion against the king, an emperor, or a president. This is against the rebellion against the kingly rule of God himself. This is not a rebellion that comes about by accident. It is a deliberate, premeditated attack on God and his people. In this rebellion, the man of lawlessness will be revealed. If Jesus obeyed God willingly out of love, then the man of lawlessness is rebelling out of his complete and utter hatred for God. Indeed, this rebellion will re reveal him, particularly to Christians, as being the opposite, exact opposite of Jesus. In other words, this man is the anti Christ that the Bible warns us about. Consider these words about him from the book of Daniel. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels had become completely wicked, a fierce looking king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong, not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. So in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul is preparing us as God's people for hard times ahead. There's a spiritual battle going on between Satan, who wants to disrupt and dis diminish God's salvation, and the Lord Jesus himself. It's a battle that, in a sense, has been going on from the time when Adam fell. But here is our encouragement. 
as we've heard in Daniel, and Paul repeats for us here in 2 Thessalonians, the man of lawlessness is doomed to destruction. Jesus has won the victory, and we can have every confidence that our salvation in him will be fulfilled. Nevertheless, the devil is a powerful foe, and we must be aware of that fact and take our refuge in Jesus. Paul is preparing us for, uh, for, for his onslaught before the final return of Jesus. This Antichrist, the man who reveals the, the DNA of the devil, will have a focus in usurping God, in pushing God, from the throne over all of creation. Not only that, but he will put himself on God's throne in the temple, demanding that the whole world worship him. God's people need to be prepared for such days. So what will actually happen? Can Paul shed any more light on the man of lawlessness to help the Thessalonian Christians and us have a clearer picture of what we should be watching for. Well, what we see in verses 5 to 12 is that Paul had begun by teaching the Thessalonians all about the man of lawlessness. He taught them these things from the Old Testament, no doubt, using the prophecy of Daniel, as he revealed to them how God <coughs> was using history to fulfil his plans and purposes in salvation. But Paul had also taught that at the moment this man was being restrained and he would only appear in God's own timing. Now isn't that interesting? One who is so bound up in the power of evil, indeed, who is going to be the ultimate expression of evil, is restricted to appear until God allows him to. Now that's a cause for rejoicing because it shows us that our God is in control. But at the same time it shouldn't be a cause for complacency. As Paul points out, the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. In other words, we know the power of lawlessness. We know the power of that rejection of God and, rebe and the rebellion against his rules for living that's already going on in people's hearts and lives and has been since Adam first rebelled against God. And at the present time, God the Holy Spirit is at work in the world and he is restraining the, the worst effects of sin. Even though we think things are bad, they're nowhere near as bad as they could be. But at the proper time, God the Father will move the Spirit out of the way. And the effect will be like that of a damn wall breaking. All the sin that the Spirit has held back will sweep over the world like a tsunami. And that is when the lawless one will be revealed. These are going to be dark days indeed for the people of God. As Paul is going to go on to describe them. But before he does that, before he does that, there's a reminder of what is to come, like a shaft of golden sunlight shining out in front of the dark clouds of sin. Christ is surely coming. The power of Satan is going to be revealed in its full force in the man of lawlessness, but he is the one whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendour of his coming. The idea behind this is that as Jesus returns in power and glory, he will crush completely the power of Satan once and for all time. The reign of sin will be decisively brought to a close as the eternal reign of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords will begin in all its fullness. Now it's good that we have this sure and certain hope as the root of our preparations for what's to come. As Paul now goes on to reveal the extent of evil that we have to face. 
And what we're going to see from the lawless one will be a masterclass in how the devil works. But everything that comes from him, the displays of power through signs and wonders that he will show, are all lies, straight from the one that Jesus calls the father of lies, to divert us from God's true way of salvation in Jesus. Now, of course, the great lie of the devil is that we can be like God. And so we see that men and women will follow all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. Those who are perishing are deceived into making themselves God, taking control of their lives, as they think, so that they can live to please themselves. But to follow this path is to follow a path that leads to the judgments of God. That's what Satan wants to see happen. He wants to blind people to the truth that we can be made right with God through Jesus. And so men and women refused and still refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Those who stand condemned already, those who refuse to love the truth have their hearts hardened by God. He sends them a powerful delusion so that they are absolutely convinced by the lies they have told. When Jesus returns, these are the people who will know his judgment. Paul writes, all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. These are solemn and serious words. Christ is surely coming. Now if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, then he is coming as your judge to condemn you. But yet, but yet, he stands ready to forgive and to cleanse you from your sin if you come to him now. Don't ignore the opportunity of his salvation whilst you have it. But grasp it, grasp it firmly with your whole being and let him transform your life through the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. For Christians the question is, what should we do in the light of Paul's teaching? The first answer is to say, don't panic. The living Lord Jesus is our guarantee of heaven and our guardian to get us there. Through what Paul has written here, he is preparing everyone who trusts in him for what is to come. But that sure and certain hope that he has given us, that sure and certain, uh, is, is there to remind us that despite days of great evil ahead, in Jesus, heaven is open for us. The second part of what we should be doing as we wait for the return of Jesus is to stand firm in him. In verses 13 to 15, Paul reminds the Thessalonian Christians of why they to do this. And these are real reasons for encouragement. Indeed, for Paul, they are reasons for thanksgiving to God. These Christians are loved by the Lord. And God revealed that because, Paul says, God chose you from the beginning. God has chosen those who trust in him from the beginning of time itself. And he graciously gives them the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us, or in other words, who puts God's DNA into us so that we become and we grow to be more and more like Jesus. He also helps us to believe in the truth of what he has done for us in Jesus. He helps us to understand what God has revealed to us about himself in the Bible so that we can trust in him. It is God who personally called each of the Thessalonian Christians through the message of good news that Paul, Silas and Timothy had brought to them. But the wonder of all this is why God has done this. The wonder of it is the reason he personally calls 
the Thessalonian Christians. The wonder of it is why he calls you and me to follow him. That you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that staggering? Isn't that absolutely amazing? That God loves his people so much that he personally calls us out of our sin and shame so that we can share in the glory of Jesus. And that for an eternity. It is a wonderful hope that we have. Jesus has made heaven open for those who trust in him. And now he's preparing everyone who trusts in him to stand firm and hold fast to the truth that Paul and his companions had taught them. This truth was either by word of mouth or by letter. But it was from a known and trusted source who had their salvation, the Thessalonians' salvation, at the heart of everything they did. Those letters, of course, were directed to Paul by God. They've become vital parts of the Bible as they show us how to stand for God in a hostile world. Christ is surely coming. He has chosen and called all those who believe in him. But we are to use these encouragements, the encouragement of God's word in particular, as we stand firm in the face of what is to come. With all those things in mind, then Paul prays for the Thessalonian Christians in verses 16 to 17. And this prayer emphasises and reinforces what he has reminded them of already. Out of the love of God the Father, we are given the eternal encouragement and good hope of being made right with God and being in a relationship with him forever through the Lord Jesus. His death has meant our new life in God, and his resurrection means that this new life will last forever. As we go through the difficult days that lie ahead, Paul prays that the Thessalonians, and also us, will continue to know his encouragement in our hearts and the DNA of Jesus will shine through as the spiritual fruit we bear in the what we do, the good deeds, and the what we say. Now these things will also encourage us as we see the Holy Spirit at work in us and in each other as we look for our sure and certain hope of Christ's return to be fulfilled. So what do these things all mean for us? The answer is this. Paul, under God's direction, has written these things down for the Thessalonians and for us so that our hope that Christ is surely coming remains firm. Now Danny once gave me an acrostic for hope which said hope means heavens open, prepare everyone. We need to be prepared for what's to come. We need to be proclaiming what's to come. Because we need to have no fear for what is to come. And however the world will come to an end, whether the climate crisis is involved or not, our God is in control. And we know how the story ends. We know how his story ends. Jesus wins. So it really doesn't matter what Satan tries to do and how he seeks to disrupt God's work. God personally, through his Holy Spirit, stands in us and with us to make sure that our salvation will be completed. Saying those things, though, doesn't take away just how hard the circumstances may be that Christians have to face. That's why God is warning us about them, so that we don't panic when faced with real hardship. But instead, we stand firm in Jesus. 
So the prayer for us today is the same as it was for the Thessalonians. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. It is by doing these things, standing firm in the scripture, seeking God in prayer and living lives to his glory that will reveal the true hope of Jesus, the true and lasting hope of Jesus to a world that is in meltdown. May God use our witness to bring those who are fearful to him. The only one who can ever give true hope to men and women. To him.